Only the best. Well, it's good to be here again. Lovely to see you all. Um, I'm not really even going to pretend this is going to be preaching tonight. It really is going to be more like Bible study. Um, so tomorrow may, might be a bit more coherent. But yeah, this is what I've got. So let's turn to Hebrews chapter 3. There'll be a fair bit of flicking, not, not too much. Um, Hebrews chapter 3, we'll read from verse 7 to the end of the chapter. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, And they have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swore he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And the second text, if, if you like, or the, um, for this evening, is, is 2 Timothy 3.16, which most of us know very well, at 16 and 17. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works now the reason I say that this isn't so much preaching as, as Bible study is I, I'm slightly nervous nervous about part of it just because th- this, is, this is basically a chain of thought that I've been on rather than something exposited from a passage so I was thinking about something and I can't remember how it started and that led to a chain of thought and, and the chain of thought was scriptures and, and, and scriptures in different circumstances but it's not, I'm not going to exposit Hebrews 3 I'm not, I'm not going to exposit um, 2 Timothy 3.16 as such and I, I think, I might be wrong I think what maybe started it off was just a series of, of times when people after church commented on thi- other pe- what other people would have thought of it. So, for example, you know, oh, I don't think so-and-so would have understood that. Or, I don't think that was very helpful for, for that. But those sorts of comments. And it, it just made, made me think, and, that, and this, is where, this is where I ended up when I was thinking. So, um, the int- those passages were read <clears throat> really to, to, to highlight two points. First, that preaching and, or the message of the Bible is urgent and that's why we read Hebrews 3 because it, it comes out again and again today if you will hear his voice three times in the same passage today if you will hear his voice harden not your heart both hearing God's message and believing it is, is urgent it needs to happen now it needs to happen to all of us in this room tonight because we're here we're here, God's word is here, we need to listen to it. So, so there, is, there is that great urgency in, in Scripture. And then the second thing to mention from 2 Timothy 3.16 is that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. All Scripture is profitable. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, it is all profitable. So some other thoughts. That, so that, I'm setting those out because at times... I'm going to stray probably to, to the side. You think I'm going to head away from one of those, but they're, they're, they're hedging me in. So if it looks like 
I'm saying something that's contrary to that, then I, I've not been clear because nothing I'm, I'm going to say I, I don't think contradicts that. Um, all scripture is profitable, every bit of it, and all scripture is urgent. So if, if I stray from that, then I've gone wrong or I've not been clear. But that, that's what, where we're starting. Um, now, some people um, like to poke fun, and, and I've taken my first show of, of poking and being poked. Um, and and it, it is quite fun for people to, to laugh at people like me, and I'm, I'm sure we're not all the same, who are um, pre-tribulational, pre-millennials. You know, so, so I believe Jesus will come back, take away the church, and then all this stuff will happen on earth while I'm not here. And then Jesus will come back again with me. And people like to vote for and say, why are you so bothered about, about that period on earth when you're not even here? And, you know, so they say, you, know, you go up in Revelation, like, end of chapter 3, and you come back in Revelation 19. Why do you care about what, what happens between chapter 3 and chapter 19? And, of course, the standard answer is that not all scripture is to you, but it is all for you. I phrase that one. That's the correct sort of formula, isn't it, to answer that? That question, which is yeah, and it's it's all good fun, but thinking about those comments, actually, I think there might be there might be something a bit more to the to the poking than that I at first want to admit. I think there is something in me, and it's probably not just in me, <clears throat> that likes to think about other people when I should be thinking about myself. I think about myself when I should be thinking of other people. So, for example, if, if I was to take the book of Revelation and, and I, you know, I've said all of it is profitable, I'm not trying to take away from that. So well, what, what of it is written to me in, in that doctrinal sense? What, what is particularly addressed to the church? Well, I would say, and hopefully this is safe, the letters to the churches are particularly pertinent to the church. Now, if you hold a different view on Revelation, you might extend that through the whole book. But for me, I, I see the letters as particularly pertinent, particularly easy to understand and apply. Not always to obey, but, you know, it's quite simple. It's a letter to a church. I'm in a church. I'm not in that church, but I, they're addressed to all churches. It's quite easy. So when, when the warnings come about not losing your first love or not following certain heresies and certain rewards, it's so easy to apply. Now... If I think that that is written so easily and obviously to me, and yet I know more about the order of events in the tribulation than I do about the letters to the churches, I think that that fun that people might like poke at me might be might have a bit more truth to it than I originally want to admit because there is that tendency to to, to want to know all the detail about locusts and scorpions and um, 42 months which is profitable I'm not trying to say it's not it is profitable but if I can't then tell you anything about what the Lord Jesus looks like from Revelation chapter 1 how glorious he is how John acts before you know, if I forget all of that because I'm concentrating on something that isn't that I know is more comfortable for me to deal with a, Doctrinally, I think, I think there's something in that, and, and I think human nature has this tendency to, when something might be uncomfortable for me, to look at someone else, and when it might be uncomfortable for me to look at someone else, to look at myself. And so that that's where that's where my, my thoughts have have been leading me. So I think that's what that's what is often behind the oh, I wonder, I wonder if so and so understood that. It might not always be behind that, but I just don't think that's the first place to go. If we're in church, or we're hearing a sermon, or, or we're reading our Bible, our first thought isn't, or shouldn't be, what's, what's this for someone else? <laughs> Especially if it's uncomfortable. The, fir the first question isn't, oh, I wonder if my friend who I brought along understood it, even though that might be a good concern. The first question is, have I understood it? The, the word of God is, is urgent for me. And God will speak to each individual. It's not, I don't have to, my first concern isn't whether somebody else understands it before I've checked whether I've understood it. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. No, not today, if you will hear his, his voice. Make sure someone else hasn't hardened their heart. 
the message comes to individuals from God. Now, we might, if we've got time and I don't waffle too much, get onto, onto a bit of the balance later. But that, that I think, is the human tendency. I, I'm listening to preaching and I think, oh, that's a message someone else needs to hear. Or, oh, yes, that, that addresses what they did. Or I'm sitting at communion thinking, I wonder if those two have sorted out their problems. That's, that ought not to be my first port of call. Not that those other things aren't true, not that those other things can't be thought about, but I think it's far too easy to slip into thinking about other people because it's more comfortable than thinking about ourselves. So I'll try and illustrate that with some scriptural examples that I thought were helpful. So since we're in Hebrews, we'll start with Hebrews chapter 13. Now, I'm not looking to get myself into any kind of ecclesiastical trouble tonight. Um, I hope that um, nothing I say is wrong on this. But also, I hope that if we have a slightly different ecclesiastical structure, we won't get hung up on that. Hopefully, the, there is enough um, here that we can all agree on. Um, it seems to me, without doing a separate study on it, that God, uh, God's design for the local church is to have elders in spiritual oversight of the church. Now, I'm not going to go any more than that because we might start to disagree about quite what the function of a pastor is. Or but if we can just say God has given some elders to have a special kind of oversight or care of the church. Now, I think that that is what is spoken about three times in Hebrews chapter 13. So I'm really cold. Can I just get away? I'm usually roasting when I'm preaching. Right, so Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7. So this is, this is the letter written to the Hebrews. This is what was read out. The whole church heard this. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Then again in verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves... For they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. And then verse 24, salute all them that have the rule over you and all the saints. So I, th I think from the reading of the whole verses, we're not talking about earthly authorities. This isn't do whatever the, go the governor or king says when you can. This is, this is different. These are people who've watched over their souls, who, who must give account for how they've looked after them. So, it seems to me that there are those that have what the Bible calls rule in the church. I don't quite like it, I'll be honest. Just as, just as a doctor, I don't like those words. They, they naturally go against my rebellious heart. But they're the words God has chosen in the Bible. Verse 7, remember them which have the rule over you. They have the rule. God has given them that. It's part of their responsibility. But to who was this? To who were these verses addressed? They're addressed to those under the rule. Remember them that have the rule over you. And then verse 17, obey them that have the rule over you. Verse 24, salute all them that have the rule over you. It's addressed to people like me, ordinary church members. I am to remember that the, those who have the rule over me, I'm to submit to them, I'm to obey them in Christ. That's, that's to who, whom it's written to. Then, if you, you might want to keep your finger in Hebrews 13 and, and turn to Acts chapter 20. Quite a famous and important um, chapter of Acts for, uh, especially the last bit for um, elders and, and those sorts of things. So we'll read Acts chapter 20, verse 28. And we'll read on from that a bit. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which 
the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so labouring ye ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. So these are words that are addressed to the elders. Paul got the elders and he said he spoke to them. And, and this is what interests me. I think there is a natural desire, I'm not saying in every person, but I see it enough in myself, to, to be more concerned with the other person's instructions. The elders aren't told that they have the rule over the flock in Acts chapter 20. They're told they are overseers, that he uses language of shepherding, of care, of giving, of sacrifice. That is the word spoken to them. And too often, I fear, a pastor or an elder feels the need to point out that they have the rule, which is not, which is not untrue, because they do have the rule. God has given them that from Hebrews 13. But he didn't tell, he didn't address them in those terms. And it's, I'm not sure, I hope you understand, I'm not trying to sort of split hairs or, or, or make some sort of, um, it's not wordplay and, and games here. The, the way people are addressed changes how they act. And the elders are told to care, to rule, the oversight, to look over in the, in the way that the Lord Jesus does, to give, to sacrifice, and the, the members are told to submit and obey. The elders aren't told to make them obey and make them submit. And the members aren't told, oh, you know, make them, make them guide, make them give, make them self-sacrificial. God has given different instructions. Now, I'm not saying that the elders need to pretend that they don't know Hebrews 13 is there. But what, what is the first point of reference? If, if, our, if our elders tell us something, it's our first thing to say, oh, they're supposed to be shepherding, not telling me. They're, they're supposed to be giving, not asking. No, that, that's because we've run to their commands in Acts chapter 20, rather than remembering what was addressed first and foremost to us as ordinary church members. We are to obey. We are to submit. And you see, there is that human tendency on both sides. The elders will want to emphasize the ruling which was addressed to the others and the church members will want to emphasize the giving and the self-sacrifice of the elders instead of the submitting both are true and both are profitable and that's what i was i wanted to be re really careful of emphasizing at the, at the start the elders ought to know both passages church members also ought to know both passages but you know it's not essential straight away you know if, if you've got a young christian and they say Brand new, and say, oh, how do I, how do I relate to the leadership? The first thing they le learn is Hebrews 13. That's what's addressed to them. Build up the rest of their knowledge and the rest of their picture later. But you start with the simple and the obvious that's addressed to us, and we can so easily forget our perspective. And, and that's, that's the theme we're going to look at. So another one, and uh, I'm sure some of you know where I'm heading, is Ephesians chapter 5. So we'll read again a good chunk of, Hebrew, of Hebrews, Ephesians chapter 5, from verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, 
So let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. It seems to me that, again, the same principle can easily apply here. Upon reading the passage, it is very easy for the man to be concerned with the submission of the woman, and the woman to be concerned for the self-sacrificial love of the man. And it's not that you, you need to, either one needs to pretend that the other exists. But that's not the first thing that each party is addressed with. As I read this, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife. And if, if I'm so caught up with wives, submit to your husbands, that I forget that actually there's something coming up that's going to address husbands, I've missed the point. I've got hung up on something that wasn't first and foremost addressed to me, to listen to something that was addressed to someone else, and vice versa. If the, woman get, if the woman thinks, oh, I don't need to submit, or I'm not listening to that submission, but until he loves me the way he should, it's, a, it's all about the love. Again, it's, it's wrong, and we have this tendency, and, and again, particularly because men preach, or they all, women ought not to be preaching, but you know, as men have historically and, and biblically should do the preaching, it is very easy for them to skew this in the way that their human tendency wants them to. So it is much easier for more emphasis from the pulpit to be given on women's submission than men's love. Because that's, that's much more comfortable for the man because it's not something he has to do. You say, yo, you women, you ought to submit to your husbands. And women ought to submit to their husbands. But that's not the command given to men. Men are commanded to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And we need to be careful that we focus first and foremost on hearing the right message for us. There is stuff we can learn, and especially in the picture of marriage, from the other, from the other side, that we must learn. So there, are, there is truth from the wife submitting to the husband, and the husband loving the wife, that we all must get, because it's about Christ and the church. So we need to understand the whole picture. But Paul is very careful to make sure... We don't get distracted by it. Do you, do you know where you're going, Anna? You okay? Um, Paul is very careful to make sure we don't get distracted by the mystery and forget the practical. That's that it, it, because the mystery is is where it's aimed at. That the whole point of marriage is to illustrate Christ and the church. But we we ought not to be so mystical about it that we forget to maintain the picture and actually work on what God's given us in the here and now. And so he says in verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So we must understand as Christians the whole picture. How actually the husband is a picture of Christ, and the wife is a picture of the church, and the church ought to submit to Christ, and Christ loves the church. And, and it works wonderfully when the church does her part well. We need to understand that. But when it comes to our practical living out of the mystery, do we instantly focus on what the other party should be doing rather than what we ought to be doing? And, and I, I feel there is a natural tendency in women to, to pass aside the submission because their husbands aren't loving them properly and in men to pass aside the loving their wives because their wives aren't submitting properly. 
And both of those cases are equally as wrong. The word is urgent to us first. So when we read Ephesians 5, the first thing we ought not to think is, that is a horrible sentence. Uh, The first thing we need to think is, what's it saying to me first? Not what is it saying to my wife or my husband first? What is it saying to me first? And as a man, a married man, I read it and I say, oh, the first thing it's saying to me is, I need to love my wife like Christ loved the church. The first thing isn't to check whether Layla's in submission to me. It's not the first thing. The first thing is that, and, and what, is, what is also particularly pertinent about this example is that neither are conditional on the other. The wife's submission to the husband isn't conditional on the husband loving his wife like Christ loved the church. And the husband's love for his wife isn't conditional on the wife's submission to him. Now, both should be there. <laughs> the whole picture should be as complete and as like the church as it should be. But the Bible doesn't give us excuses to hide behind. Oh, well, I would love my wife if she submitted. Well, I would, love my hu- I would submit to my husband if he loved me. There's none of that. The Bible tells us what we need to do. And I suspect we would find more success if we focused on what God told us to do rather than whining about the fact it doesn't work because the other party won't do what they're supposed to do. Just in that light, is it First Peter chapter 3? Um, and verse 1. Likewise, you wives be in subjection to your, to your own husbands. So very similar language to what we've just read in Ephesians 5. It's 1 Peter 3 verse 1. Likewise, you wives be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also, without the word, be warned by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. And it goes on to, to inverse that. But you see, actually... The, the husband can be completely, well, just not a Christian. And, and could have all the worst characteristics of not being a Christian. And yet the wife is still to do her part. And, it, and in 1 Corinthians 6, it says, if, if there's unbelievers married, if, if one party is, if the, if the unbelieving party is willing to remain, they should remain. As much as possible, we, we maintain our part are half of this and God works through that so the wife is commanded in, in 1 Peter 3 and this, this is a big ask to be in subjection to a, an unbelieving husband who, who re- could recognize, might not recognise any command to love his wife from the scriptures and yet God says that they may also be warned without the word by the conversation of the wives God works when we do what he asks us to do not when we make sure others do what he's asking them to do and so when we read these passages about how we relate to our husbands or wives we really need to think about what is required of us first rather than what is required of someone else I hope that makes sense again to emphasize it's not to say that we mustn't understand the complete picture particularly with the husbands and wives it's very important that we understand the whole picture because it's a picture of Christ and the church. Um, Another example is Matthew chapter 5, excuse me, and verse Matthew 5, 28. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now, the reason, the reason I picked this one is because it, it made me th- I was thinking about something else and, and it came in. I remember someone commenting on this verse. Good preacher. Um, and he took up a good bit of time talking about the, the word with in the verse. Um, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath already committed adultery with her already in his heart. And he was was talking about how a woman's clothing can entice this kind of behaviour, about sort of loose dressing and and provocative clothing 
can entice a man to to commit adultery with her. The point is that there's a with to it. It's not it's not the man on his own. It's 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 more than that. It's not that the woman is just some sort of completely just. And you know, I think there is some truth in that. But to say that that is the first and most important part of this verse is a is a huge miss. <laughs> I mean, that. Th- I, I want to be careful because because that is there in the, I think there in the verse. But the first place you run to is don't look on a woman to lust after them. Surely that that is the primary meaning of the verse. Don't do it. The, the emphasis isn't on the person being looked on, as far as I can tell. There are other passages which address how we dress. I, I'm fully well convinced that a man can lust after a woman if she's just got two eyes peeking out of a hijab. Do you know, it, it's not. It, <laughs> do you know, I didn't write that line down. <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm sure that's possible. And then, could, I mean, what, what other steps could you take as, as a woman? Like, drape yourself in a cloth and just leave you enough space to see where you're going. Doesn't necessarily stop men lusting after you. Probably helps. But uh, that's, the point here isn't to read the verse and say, oh, control the way they dress. Stop those women from giving us these bad thoughts. The point is, don't look at a woman and lust after them. The emphasis is on the person doing the looking, not the person being looked after. But our hearts have a tendency to want to, to, want to take the edge off the clarity of that kind of, that kind of command. Because it's so raw. And to the pure, all things are pure. I don't want to get too bogged down into this. It, it, I mean, actually, it, it came up. It came up last time I was here. And I, I hope this. I hope this is unfair. I feel bad because Mike Dunn isn't here. We, I, I mentioned. I mentioned that uh, I was talking about nakedness in in public life, and, and I remember seeing a billboard of a, of a model just dressed in in underwear, and ha, I, it shocked me straight away. And I remember Mike saying he's a photographer, and he said. He never thought about lust from the picture. Is what he was looking at was an expertly shot photograph, and I seem to remember thinking, "Well, that, but that's you know, surely not." <laughs> mm-hmm. But to the pure, all things are pure, and, and there the must the must be. I want to I want to allow that to be a genuine possibility. That I, I can see. I'm going to display some pretty shocking. Um, art knowledge now if this isn't true um, just 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 pick a naked model will you if you know one it's the Venus de Mila I know she's got no arms but she's got some, she's not going to close her is she okay so you know I want to believe that it's possible to look at a work of art and not lust just because it has female form or to look at Michelangelo's David and not lust you know it's not it's not the problem isn't the thing being looked at necessarily even though there are other passages in the Bible that I don't want to take away from that talk about how we should dress and why we should dress the way we should. The problem here, clearly, it seems to me, is if you look on a woman to lust after, you have committed adultery. If I look at a woman to lust after, I have committed adultery. That's the first and foremost. Again, anything we do to try and take the edge off that is showing that actually we'd rather think about the other person. Oh, she shouldn't have been dressing like that, otherwise I wouldn't have lusted after her. Wrong. God has given us enough Holy Spirit and enough power to resist that kind of thing. And, and I, I want to believe, and I do believe, that you can, you can find yourself in circumstances where you could easily be led by your lusts, whatever they might be, to sin, but not do it because God has given you enough power to, 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 not, to not follow them through. And God, God puts lots of safeguards in. And I think that's what those other things are. The things about dress and the things about how we act are there as safeguards because God knows we're weak. But it doesn't mean that it's not possible to resist this kind of temptation. And that, that's, that's the thing that the verse is highlighting for me. It's not a verse about how people ought to dress. It's a verse about our hearts. And, and, and this, will, this, this comes up 
Do you see what I mean? There's always this temptation to, to, to change the gaze away from ourselves. Sometimes it, it's, it's, when, it's when, when the gaze ought to be on others, we put it on ourselves. So you know, it says, do good unto all men. And you think, who's doing good to me? <laughs> I'm one of all men. <laughs> Why isn't anyone helping me? So sometimes it goes the other way. Wherever our, God wants our gaze... Wherever God wants our efforts as Christians, there is a human tendency in our sinful nature to look the opposite way, whichever way that is, whether it's towards ourselves or away from ourselves. And, and finally, we'll, we'll finish with this, I think. There is a tendency, I think, to major on the sins of the world in the church because that's easier than emphasising the sins of the church in the church. And I, I have been left um, unconvinced um, by the by the level of oh dear um, sometimes vitriol, but just general sort of bloviating about gay marriage. Which really, let's be honest, is not that big a deal inside the church. But isn't it great to be able to have something to really morally grandstand about, knowing that almost no, none of the people who are there listening to you are affected by it? It's it just... It's not that it shouldn't be addressed. It clearly is important. But I have heard more people mention it as an example, and obviously I've done it, so, you yeah. know add me as well I've heard more people mention it as an example in the last few years than I think I ever heard people talk about fornication in the 10 or 15 years leading up to gay marriage and which of them is more a problem in the church I'm sure homosexuality is a problem in the church sometimes but it's not half the biggest problem as fornication is and it just it's so easy, and you know, it would be so easy for me to preach against the sin that isn't really happening here. But actually, I think, not that God doesn't want us to address that, but we've really got to ask ourselves as, as churches, what, what is God saying to me and to us? And we can spend all our time talking about what God is saying to them and never actually saying it to them. So, you know, it's out of the world going to hell, all these sinners, they're all, they're all doing this, and they're, they're blaspheming God, they're worshipping false idols, they believe in the God of evolution. And all of that's true. Of course it's true. But why am I telling you lot that? You know that. Now, there might be a good reason for me to tell you that. But me wanting to look like a, a strong preacher, and me wanting to sort of show how badly I can preach against, how well I can preach against sin, isn't a good enough reason. Grandstanding is just not right for preachers. And one of the reasons why that isn't okay, because it can leave us all going out justified in our own sight. We come to church, we hear about a bunch of stuff that isn't in our lives, that isn't, it probably isn't going to be in our lives, doesn't affect us, or that used to be in our lives so long ago we've forgotten about it. And then we walk outside thinking that we're right. And we've justified ourselves in our own eyes. But we need to... We need to come ready to hear what, what is God saying to me, not what is God saying to the person sitting next to me or the world out there that aren't even listening. I, I won't really try and balance that out um, because I think that's the point. All, all the things that the world is doing need to be preached against. And there are reasons why they can be preached against in the church, but the reason they all... I'm really struggling tonight to, to not use stupid sentences. But it's, we shouldn't think we, it's an easy, good preach and an easy way of getting ourselves off the hook for the things that God wants us to deal with as Christians. You can pretty much then just run through anything in the Bible that applies to an individual and then see how the human being will naturally turn it away, whether it's gambling or debt or giving or charity, you know, whatever it is, you can, you can you know, Oh, you hear a passage on tithing. Although they, can't, they clearly can't be tithing because I know they earn about 200 grand a year and if they were tithing, we'd be doing all right as a church. So do you see what I mean? It's so easy. 
But the first thing to be, oh, look at someone else. But the first thing should be, um, wait a minute, is that, is that him that we like to, what hast thou to say to me? And it, because of the, the comments, like I said, that led me to, along this line of thought, really my, my aim, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not always there, is to come to church with that in my heart, what is God going to say to me? What does God want me to hear? What will he say to me? And help me to hear it and obey it, not to, to think, oh, that was a great sermon for such and such. Stop. <laughs>